Like pressure and flow, there are a variety of methods used to measure level and temperature. In this unit, we'll begin with some simple methods of measuring liquid level directly from the liquid in a tank or vessel. Then, we'll cover some typical methods of indirectly measuring the level of liquids and solids. Finally, we'll take a look at instruments and systems commonly used to measure temperature. Let's begin by looking at one of the simplest methods of measuring the level of liquid directly. You're already familiar with it if you've ever made a pot of coffee. Typically, there are markings on a coffee pot that indicates the water level required. By matching the water level to the indication on the pot, you are directly measuring the amount of water necessary to do the job. Likewise, in the plant, direct level measurement instruments provide you with indications of liquid level measured directly from the liquid in a tank or vessel. These indications provide important information so that you can determine if the proper level is being maintained and whether equipment is operating properly. This information can also be used to take inventories and to plan periodic maintenance. For example, the air compressor behind me will break down if the oil in the reservoir isn't maintained at the proper level. The oil must be checked before this air compressor is started and then periodically while it's running. This is done using a dipstick located in the oil reservoir. A dipstick is nothing more than a calibrated rod that's inserted into a liquid and then withdrawn to be read. The first step in using a dipstick is to remove it and wipe it clean. Oil already on the dipstick could give you a false reading. Next, the dipstick is inserted into the oil reservoir and firmly seated against the casing. If it is not pushed in all the way, it could give you a low reading. The dipstick is now coated with oil and should be withdrawn straight up out of the reservoir. The top of the oil level is indicated by the point where the dipstick is no longer coated with oil. The brass collar near the top of this dipstick indicates the oil level when the reservoir is full. A line stamped near the bottom of the dipstick indicates a low level. As long as the oil is somewhere between the two markings, it is within the normal operating range. If the oil level were at or below the low indication, more oil would have to be added to the reservoir. Not all dipsticks use the same indications of full and low. You'll need to ask your instructor how the dipsticks in your plant are marked. But just about every dipstick will indicate the points at which the level in a reservoir is no longer within the normal operating range. Now, while dipsticks have many applications in the power plant, their use is limited by the size of the tank being measured. Since the accuracy of a dipstick depends on its being inserted through the full operating range of the tank, they are impractical for measuring very high tanks. A dipstick used to measure level on this 30-foot fuel tank, for example, would be very difficult for one operator to handle. And you can imagine having to wipe the oil off a dipstick that long. For tall tanks, it's usually more efficient to use a float device to indicate level. Floats ride on the surface of a liquid and move up or down as the level of the liquid changes. Floats can be designed in a number of ways. We'll use this model to show you a typical example. All other designs work on the same principle that we're going to demonstrate. Here is the float. The float is connected to a calibrated rod. This one is marked off in inches. The rod is read here. Right now, it's indicating a level of nine inches of water in the tank. Watch what happens when we increase the level in the tank. As level increases, the float rides on the surface of the liquid, causing the indicating rod to move up. Now, the rod indicates that there is 13 inches of water in the tank. As we said earlier, there are many variations in float devices. Here's a float instrument that's used to indicate the oil level in an oil reservoir. Here's the rod that's attached to a float in the reservoir. Instead of marking the oil level on the indicating rod, a scale has been mounted next to the rod. 
The red area at the top of the scale identifies too high a level, and the red area at the bottom of the scale identifies too low a level. The green area in between is the normal level range for the oil reservoir. To read this indicator, you simply compare the position of the top of the rod with the scale. As long as it's within the area of the green band, the level is satisfactory. One variation of the float device uses a cable, pulleys, window, and a scale to indicate level. The cable connects the scale to the float. The scale in this example is somewhat different from ones you've seen before. It increases from bottom to top. This means that level and indication move in opposite directions. For example, when we add water to this tank, the scale moves down through the window to show an increase in level. By the same token, when water is removed from the tank, the float drops with the water level while the scale rises to indicate the decrease in level. As with all measuring instruments, it is important that you know how the measurement is being indicated so that you don't become confused. Another float device commonly found on large storage tanks works pretty much the same way, but instead of a cable and pointer, a measuring tape is used. One end of the tape is attached by a cable to the float inside the tank. The tape is enclosed in piping that extends from the top of the tank all the way down to the point where level is indicated. The other end of the tape is connected to a wind-up reel inside this casing. As the float moves up or down, the tape is released or retracted. The actual level of the tank can be read through this viewing window. Inside the window is a reference point where the measurements should be taken. In this example, the level of this tank is just under 21 feet 7 inches. Float devices can also be used to initiate alarms. This usually involves opening or closing contacts on an electrical switch. This is a typical float instrument that uses a magnetic switch to initiate level alarms on a feed water heater. Let's take a look inside and see how it works. In this drawing, you see the float and the contacts for the magnetic switch. This is the switch for the high level alarm. And this is the one for the low level alarm. A magnet is attached to a rod which is operated by the float. The chamber containing the float is connected to the feed water heater by this top connection and this bottom connection. As the level in the feed water heater changes, so does the position of the float. If level increases, the float and the magnet rise. When too high a level is reached, the magnet is positioned such that its magnetic attraction closes contacts which complete an electrical circuit. The completed circuit then initiates a high level alarm. By the same token, if water level decreases, the float and magnet drop accordingly. If the level drops too low, then the magnetic attraction of the magnet closes another set of contacts which initiates a low level alarm. The final direct level measuring device that we need to look at is a gauge glass, or sight glass as it's sometimes called. Simply stated, gauge glasses are vertical tubes attached to a tank. Fluid inside the tank flows into the tube, and as it does, any vapor in the gauge glass flows out the top and into the tank. The gauge glass is transparent so you can see the level. This level is the same as the level in the tank. All gauge glasses work on this principle. However, there are many variations that you should be aware of. The three most common types of gauge glasses are the tubular gauge glass, the flat gauge glass, and the multiple port or multi-port gauge glass. A tubular gauge glass consists of two gauge valves connected by a piece of glass tubing. A tubular glass will often have a colored line on the back of the glass to make the level of a clear fluid easier to see. Another way of making the level easier to see is illuminating the gauge with a strong light. The light can be permanently installed near the glass 
or a flashlight can be used. The second type of gauge glass, the flat gauge glass, is more rugged than the tubular type and more suitable for use at higher pressures. Flat gauge glasses are often used to indicate levels in steam drums and feed water heaters. A typical flat gauge glass looks like this one. It has a metal body with a long, narrow hole down the middle, and this hole is covered with thick pieces of flat glass that are held in place by a cover plate. Many flat gauge glasses have illuminators because they are difficult to read if lighting is poor or the fluid is clear. The final type of gauge glass that we need to look at is the multiple port gauge glass. Multiple port gauge glasses are often used on high pressure components, such as boiler drums. A typical multiple port gauge glass has a slightly wedge-shaped body with a series of round openings on each side. The openings are covered with thick pieces of glass held in place by cover plates that are bolted to the body. There are valves in the upper and lower connections so that the gauge can be isolated for maintenance. The valves on any of the gauges we've seen may use chain wheels or some other method that allows operation from a distance. A drain valve may be located at the bottom of the gauge so that the gauge can be drained for maintenance. Multiple port gauge glasses can appear empty because the fluid level is not visible when it is between ports. Sometimes special illuminators are used to solve this problem. The illuminator has red and green screens that color the light reaching the gauge. The light is bent as it passes through the gauge. It bends differently depending on whether there is water or steam in the gauge glass. If there is steam in the gauge, the light will be bent so that only red light comes through. When water is in the gauge, the light is bent so that only green light comes through. Therefore, the ports above the water level shine red, and the ports below the water level shine green. This type of illuminator is sometimes used on flat gauge glasses as well, to make their indications easier to read. Gauge glasses, like most direct level measuring devices, are usually used for local level indication. However, in situations where remote indication is necessary, it can often be accomplished by using mirrors, like you see here, or closed circuit television cameras. Well, you now know some of the most common methods for indicating level directly from the level of liquid in a tank or vessel. Read this segment in your text and answer the questions. When you come back, We'll look at indirect methods of level measurement. Remember, if you have any questions, your instructor is there to help you. In the last segment, you learned that the levels of liquids can be measured directly by using dipsticks and gauge glasses. While these are accurate and reliable level measuring instruments, they do have a limitation of being primarily designed for local indication. We also looked at float type level instruments, which are often used for remote indication, but there are only one way of doing this. There are several other methods of indicating level remotely that are classified as indirect methods. By indirect, we mean that the methods usually involve some conversion process. Let me show you what I mean. In the last unit, we use this apparatus to demonstrate that pressure exerted by a column of liquid is proportional to the height of the liquid above the point where pressure is being measured. As you know, the pressure exerted by the height of a column of liquid is called the static head. In this segment, we'll use this same apparatus to demonstrate how liquid level can be measured using static head. You've learned that this one foot column of water is exerting a pressure on the bottom of the column of about 0.43 pounds per square inch. Ordinarily, you might expect this gauge to indicate pressure. However, we can use the gauge to indicate level. Now, since 0.43 PSIG is equal to one foot of water, and one foot of water is equal to 0.43 PSIG, it is possible to use them interchangeably. What we've done is remove all of the pressure markings from this gauge and substituted markings that indicate level. 
So, where the pressure gauge would indicate 0.43 PSIG, we've marked it as one foot of water. We've done the same thing for the other markings on the gauge. Now, when water is added to the column, we can read the level directly from the gauge. As you know, pressure sensors can be connected to transmitters for remote indication, or operate switches that initiate alarms, or turn equipment on or off. Well, the same is true for pressure sensors used to detect level. For example, this Borden tube pressure sensor, which is being used to measure level in a condensate storage tank, operates a mercury switch. Here's the Borden tube. Here's the mercury switch. Connecting them is this mechanical linkage. When the liquid in the tank reaches a predetermined level, the mechanical linkage tips the vial of mercury completing a circuit. In this case, the circuit is connected to an enunciator alarm in the control room. Level switches can also be used to start or stop a piece of equipment, such as a pump. A level switch could be installed so that when level in the tank was low, the switch would complete the circuit, starting a pump. The pump would then fill the tank. When the tank is filled, the pump could be stopped by a second switch. As you can see, static head is a simple and accurate method for measuring level, and it is easily adapted for control functions. But this design doesn't work very well when there's a pressure on the tank or vessel where level is being measured. One example would be a boiler drum. We've attached a pressure gauge that measures level. We use this gauge to measure the level in a boiler drum. We immediately run into two problems. First, the pressure inside a boiler drum changes. These fluctuations in pressure would be sensed by the level indicator. Remember, we're using a pressure instrument that converts pressure measurements to level measurements. So. If the pressure inside the boiler drum changes, but the level remains the same, the indicator would show that level changed, when level really didn't change at all. To understand the second problem, you need to recognize that there are two factors that create pressure at the bottom of a boiler drum. First, there is the pressure resulting from the steam pressure on the surface of the water. As you know, this steam pressure may be as high as 2,000 pounds per square inch, or even higher. The second pressure is created by the static head of the water in the boiler drum. Obviously, this pressure is considerably less than steam pressure. In fact, it's usually less than one pound per square inch. The total pressure at the bottom of a boiler drum is steam pressure plus the static head pressure. Now, the problem comes in when you try to measure the small changes in pressure that result from changes in the static head. A one-inch change in water level only increases static head pressure by about four one-hundredths PSI. It is very difficult to design a gauge that is capable of measuring a pressure of 2,000 PSI or more, and at the same time, sensitive enough to indicate a change in pressure as small as four one-hundredths PSI. Fortunately, this problem is not insurmountable. All we have to do is design a system that will allow us to cancel out the pressure exerted by the steam in the drum. A typical way of doing this is to attach two columns of water to the boiler drum and use the differential pressure between them to calculate drum level. This is a simplified diagram of a two-column system. This column is called the standard column, or the reference leg, and is always filled with water. This column is called the variable column, or leg, and has a water level equal to the water level in the boiler drum. Lines tapped off at the bottom of each leg are attached to a differential pressure measuring device. Since both the reference leg and the variable leg are attached to the boiler drum, boiler steam pressure is exerted on both of them. If steam pressure goes up, the steam pressure exerted on each of the legs increases by the same amount. If steam pressure decreases, then the same decrease in pressure takes place on each of the legs. With this arrangement, the effect of steam pressure is canceled out. Now the only thing left to affect the pressure difference between the two legs 
is the difference in the height of water in each leg. And we can use this difference to calculate level. Let's see how this is done. The reference leg is always full of water, and so it is always exerting the same pressure. The water level in the variable leg is always the same as the water level in the boiler drum. So, the pressure exerted by this leg changes whenever the level in the drum changes. When the drum level is at its lowest level, the difference in pressure between the variable leg and reference leg is at its greatest value. If boiler drum level increases, the difference in pressure between the reference leg and the variable leg decreases. Likewise, when boiler drum level decreases, the differential pressure between the two legs increases. The differential pressure measuring instrument attached to each of the legs measures the difference in pressure and calculates a level reading. A level may be displayed locally, remotely, or both. Now, this two-column system is only one way of measuring level in a boiler drum. There are some variations in this design. In the next segment, we'll look at one of these variations and then go on to talk about two common methods for indirectly measuring the level of solids. For now, read the material in the text and answer the questions. If you have any problems with any of this material, ask your instructor to help you. You learn that the liquid level in a tank or vessel can be measured using static head. You also learn that measurements taken in this manner won't be accurate if the tank or vessel in question is under pressure. Any changes in the pressure of the container will result in inaccurate readings. To measure level in a pressurized tank, such as a boiler drum, you learn that a two-column system is commonly used. However, there is a second way of designing this type of level measuring instrument. That is, to place one column inside the other. Let's look inside one and see how it works. The inner column is the reference leg, and, as before, is kept filled with water. The reference leg is surrounded by the variable leg. The level of water in the variable leg is the same as the level in the boiler drum. The two legs are connected to a differential pressure measuring instrument that measures the difference in pressure between both legs. As in the first example, both the reference leg and the variable leg are connected to the boiler drum so that the effects of boiler steam pressure are eliminated. In order for any boiler level measuring instrument to accurately measure level, the reference leg must be kept full of water. This is accomplished by condensation of steam in the upper tap. The condensate drips into the reference leg, keeping it constantly filled. The excess simply overflows the reference leg into the variable leg and eventually goes back into the boiler drum. Here's an actual boiler level detecting instrument that has one leg inside the other. The differential pressure between the two legs is sent to a gauge located near a window in the control room. It's a vertical gauge and is illuminated to make it easier to read. Here's the other type of level instrument with two separate legs. This is the variable leg, and here's the reference leg. A differential pressure instrument measures the differential pressure between the reference and variable legs and sends this information to a transmitter. The transmitter produces a proportional pneumatic or electrical signal which is sent to a remote indicator in the control room. In this case, the remote indicator is a circular chart recorder. It provides a permanent record of drum level recorded over a 24-hour period. Instruments such as these can also provide a signal for an alarm. When drum level reaches a certain level, the alarm goes off. This alerts the operator of a possible problem. We've now seen two boiler level measurement instruments at work. It's not unusual to find both types used on one boiler. Next, we're going to see how this knowledge of boiler level measurement instruments can be applied. Like any other instrumentation system, the more you know about them, the better prepared you are to operate them and to handle any problems that may develop. One example, which fortunately doesn't happen too often, is if there's a sudden and dramatic pressure decrease in the boiler. In this situation, 
the instruments may not indicate an accurate level reading. What happens is this. The temperature of the water in the reference leg is normally lower than the saturation temperature for the boiler pressure. If the boiler pressure suddenly drops very low, the temperature of the reference leg may be greater than the saturation temperature for the new lower pressure. This means that the water in the reference leg is hot enough to boil and it'll begin to flash to steam. As the water boils off the reference leg, the level in the reference leg decreases. Reducing the level of the reference leg decreases the differential pressure between the reference leg and the variable leg. The result is that even though there has been no actual change in the water level in the boiler drum, the level indicator shows an increase in level due to the decrease in differential pressure. As we said earlier, situations like this don't happen often. But understanding how the instrument works helps you to make the right decision whenever you're faced with situations you've never seen before. Now, one other thing that you should be aware of is that there's a limit to the range of level that can be measured in this type of system. The range of measurement can be no greater than the distance between the upper and lower tap of the boiler drum. If the level in the boiler drum is at or below the lower tap, then the difference in pressure between the two legs is at its greatest value. It can't get any larger regardless of how low drum level drops. So level can't be measured below the lower tap. Likewise, when the level of the boiler drum reaches the upper tap, then the differential pressure between the two legs is zero. If level keeps rising, the differential pressure won't get any smaller. This means that level cannot be measured above the upper tap. Well, you've now seen how liquid level can be measured using static head and other indirect means. Let's now look at the measurement of solids. In a coal plant, it's necessary to keep inventory of a tremendous amount of coal. Two common methods of measuring the level of solids, such as coal, include the use of load cells and diaphragm switches. We'll cover load cells first. Here's a simplified diagram showing how load cells are used. Here is a bin containing coal, and here are four load cells. A load cell is nothing more than a sophisticated scale that measures weight. They're installed so that they measure the weight of the bin and its contents. The weight on all four cells is added together by a summing device, which calculates the level measurement and displays it on an indicator. A second indirect solid level measuring instrument uses diaphragm switches. Each one of these is a diaphragm switch. This method is sometimes called point level detection because level is detected only at various points along the height of a bin rather than in a continuous band. Local indication, such as a light, is sometimes used to indicate level. In this case, if the light is on, it means that there is a solid at that level. A typical diaphragm switch consists of a flexible diaphragm, a lever, and a switch. Attached to the lever is a counterweight, which keeps the lever pushed forward and the switch in the off position until it is activated by the contents of the bin. Here's the light that's operated by the switch. As the level in the bin increases, the switch at each succeeding level is operated and the light is turned on. As the level of the bin decreases, the counterweights return the switch to the off position and the light turns off. The indicating light may be either local or remote. These switches can also be used to initiate alarms or as a control device to start or stop the equipment that fills the bin. Now, diaphragm switches are not exclusively used to measure the level of solids. Similar switches can also be used to measure the level of liquids. Load cells and diaphragm switches are common ways of measuring solids. But keep in mind that most solid level measuring instruments are customized for specific plants. You may have to ask your instructor how this information applies to your plant. We've covered a great deal of material in these last two segments on indirect level measurement devices. You learned how static head can be used to measure level. 
and how two measuring instruments are used to measure level in a boiler drum. Finally, you've seen two different methods for measuring the level of solids, load cells and diaphragm switches. We'll stop here so that you can read the text and answer the questions at the end of this segment. When we come back, we'll look at instruments and systems that are commonly used to measure the temperature of liquids and solids. Remember, if you have any questions about level measurement, be sure to clear them up with your instructor before going on. Now that you've learned how level is measured, and some of the most common methods of indicating level, it's time to look at temperature measurement and indication. One place where temperature is very important is the main steam system. A main steam temperature that's too low could cause some of the steam entering the turbine to condense. This would result in serious damage to the turbine blades. Similarly, too high a temperature could cause the boiler to be damaged. But all of this can be avoided by using temperature instruments to monitor these and other important temperatures and by operating systems in the plant so the temperatures do not exceed specified limits. When talking about temperature measuring instruments, usually the first thing that comes to mind is a thermometer. There are two basic types of thermometers, liquid-filled thermometers and bimetallic thermometers. Regardless of the type of thermometer that's used, they all work on the same principle. When liquids or metals are heated or cooled, they expand or contract in direct proportion to the increase or decrease in temperature. We use this expansion and contraction as a means of indicating temperature. Liquid-filled thermometers use the expansion of a liquid such as alcohol or mercury to indicate temperature. These types of thermometers have three basic parts. A stem, which is a tube with a hole bored through the center of it, a sensing or a thermal bulb, which contains the liquid, and a scale located on or near the stem. Typically, temperature scales are marked in degrees Fahrenheit, centigrade, or both. This one's marked in degrees Fahrenheit. To measure temperature with a liquid-filled thermometer, the sensing bulb is placed where the temperature is to be measured. This could be any number of places in the plant. You'll find thermometers placed directly in pipes, hanging on walls, or installed on various components and systems. The temperature of the fluid or solid being measured will either heat or cool the liquid in the sensing bulb, causing it to expand or contract. We'll show you how this works by using this mercury-filled thermometer. The water in this beaker is relatively warm. As a result, the mercury in the thermometer is heated and expands causing it to move up the hole in the center of the stem. Watch what happens when we place the thermometer in this beaker of cooler water. The mercury inside cools and contracts. This causes the mercury to move down the stem. Now many temperature readings are taken in exactly the same way we've demonstrated here. That is, the sensing element of the thermometer is placed directly in the fluid being measured, or, in the case of solids, directly on the material being measured. However, there are situations where this procedure doesn't work well. If the material is highly corrosive or under a great deal of pressure, the sensing element could be damaged. To prevent this from happening, thermal wells can be used. A thermal well is a recessed opening that protrudes into the component where temperature measurements are taken. Here's an example of one installed in a pipe. In this case, the thermal well extends into the path of the fluid being measured and is usually about the same temperature as the fluid. If temperature fluctuates, there may be some temperature difference between the thermal well and the fluid. As a result, changes in temperature may not be immediately sensed because there is a time delay before the thermal well reaches the same temperature as the fluid. This is one of the disadvantages of thermal wells. One advantage is that they allow for the easy removal and replacement of sensing elements for maintenance purposes. Thermal wells can be used for almost all types of temperature measuring instruments. 
An example of a liquid-filled thermometer that's often used with a thermal well is this thermometer measuring the temperature of cooling water going to an oil cooler. The water cools oil returning from bearings and is a crucial factor in the operation of the bearing oil system. For this reason, accuracy is important. That's one of the advantages of liquid-fill thermometers. They are extremely accurate instruments, but they are also relatively fragile. For more rugged applications, bimetallic thermometers are often used. Bimetallic thermometers come in a different variety of shapes and designs, but they all work on the same principle, the expansion or contraction of metal as it is heated or cooled. The biggest difference between liquid-filled and bimetallic thermometers is the design of the sensing element. Instead of a liquid-filled bulb, the sensing element of this typical bimetallic thermometer consists of two different metals that are joined together back to back. In some designs, the metals may be formed into a spiral, helix, or some other shape. When the temperature around the sensing element changes, the two metals expand or contract at different rates, causing the element to move. This movement is in direct proportion to the temperature change. Now, this is a very simple design, but most bimetallic thermometers used in the plant are more complicated. For example, this one contains a bimetallic element which is helically wound. The helical shape produces a long, slender sensing element which allows for good penetration into a thermal well or directly into whatever is being measured. Let's take a look at this simplified drawing of the inside of the thermometer and see how it works. One end is fixed in position while the other end is connected to a rod and pointer. Changes in temperature cause the element to coil or uncoil, resulting in rotation of the rod. The pointer on the rod indicates the temperature. In addition to being more rugged than liquid-filled thermometers, there is another advantage to using bimetallic thermometers. They can be connected to transmitters, thus providing for remote indication. We can see how this works by looking at the bimetallic element we saw earlier. Notice we've added a pneumatic transmitter. This linkage connects the bimetallic element to the transmitter. Supply air enters the transmitter here, and the output air signal exits here. As temperature changes, the bimetallic element moves. This movement causes the mechanical linkage to vary the output signal from the transmitter in proportion to the change in temperature. This information is then sent to remote indicators or used to initiate alarms. Now, while both liquid-filled and bimetallic thermometers are very useful and accurate ways of measuring and indicating temperature, there are other methods that you should be aware of. One common alternative is a filled thermal system. Here, you see a simplified diagram of a typical filled thermal system. It consists of a sensing element, capillary tubing, a pressure measuring device, in this case a Borden tube, a scale, and a pointer. The sensing bulb, the capillary tube, and the Borden tube are all filled with a fluid such as alcohol or a gas. Filled thermal systems work on the principle that any change in temperature will cause a corresponding change in the pressure exerted by the fluid. When the temperature increases, the fluid in the system expands, increasing the pressure. The Borden tube reacts to this pressure increase and mechanical linkage moves the pointer along the scale to indicate the temperature. If temperature decreases, the fluid contracts and the fluid pressure decreases. Again, the Borden tube reacts to this decrease in pressure and repositions the pointer accordingly. Because the sensing element is connected to the indicator by the capillary tube, limited remote indication is possible with this system. However, capillary tubing is fragile and can only be used for relatively short distances. For truly remote indication, the filled thermal system must be connected to a transmitter. In the filled thermal system we've been looking at, the Borden tube is connected to the transmitter by a linking rod. The sensing element, the capillary tubing, and the Borden tube remain unchanged. When temperature increases or decreases, 
the movement of the Borden tube regulates the transmitter output. The resulting pneumatic or electric signal is sent to a remote location where it is used to operate indicators or alarms. Let's look at an actual filled thermal system used to measure the temperature of cooling water leaving a heat exchanger. The sensing element is placed inside a thermal well. This is the capillary tubing. It connects the sensing element to a transmitter. The sensing element senses the changes in temperature and relays this information to the transmitter. The transmitter then sends a corresponding air or electrical signal to remote indicators in the control room. Now you know some of the basic methods for measuring temperature and the common instruments used. And you've seen how thermal wells protect temperature sensors and allow them to be replaced or repaired easily. In the next segment, we'll look at electrical temperature measurement instruments. But first, we'll stop here so that you can read the material in the text and answer the questions. In the next segment, we'll look at some instruments that use electricity as a means of measuring temperature. In the last segment, you learn that expansion and contraction of metals or liquids can be used to measure temperature. You also learn that a filled thermal system uses pressure from expanding or contracting fluids to indicate temperature. Finally, you saw how these measuring instruments can be connected to transmitters for remote indication. Now, there are three other methods for measuring temperature which we'll discuss. All of these base their measurement on the electrical properties of certain metals. The electrical temperature measurement instruments we'll be looking at are thermocouples, resistance temperature detectors, and contact pyrometers. Each of these operate in different ways, but they all work on the principle that the electrical properties of certain metals change as their temperature changes. We can see one application of this principle by looking at this simplified diagram of a thermocouple. A thermocouple consists of two wires made of dissimilar metals which are joined together. Where the two metals are joined is called the hot or measuring junction. The other end of the wires complete an electrical circuit at the cold or reference junction. A meter is connected between the measuring and reference junction. When heat is applied to the measuring junction, one metal gives up electrons while the other metal accepts electrons and a current flow is produced. The current flow is proportional to the temperature difference between the reference junction and the measuring junction. The greater the difference, the greater the current flow that's produced. A meter measures the current flow and is calibrated to indicate temperature. Here's a simple thermocouple that we've made to help you understand how they work. It has two wires inside a protective sheath. One wire is made of constantan and the other is made of copper. The metals used in thermocouples vary and are chosen for the specific temperature range and accuracy that's needed. We've connected the thermocouple to this box, which contains circuitry that you'd normally find in the plant. This circuitry is used to operate a meter that displays temperature. It also operates an alarm. The alarm is set up so that when temperature reaches 120 degrees Fahrenheit, this light will come on. Where the thermocouple is connected to the box is the reference junction. This end, the part that's placed where the temperature is being measured, is the measuring junction. I'm going to put the measuring junction in this beaker of cold water and we'll see what happens. The temperature drops rapidly, showing how quickly thermocouples respond to temperature changes. Now, I'll remove the thermocouple from the cold water and place it in the hot water. This time, watch the temperature change, but also keep an eye on the light. When 120 degrees is reached, the light will come on. Notice that the response of the thermocouple is just as fast for a temperature increase as it was for a temperature decrease. In addition to alarms, thermocouples can also operate recorders. This, for example, is one of several measuring junctions for thermocouples that measure oil or metal temperatures on a hydraulic coupling. 
This is one of several measuring junctions connected to this recorder in the control room. The recorder changes the current flow produced by the thermocouples into temperature measurements that can be read directly from the scale on the face of the recorder, as well as from the permanent recording made on the chart. Inside the recorder are the reference junctions for each of the thermocouples. Now, one important consideration when thermocouples are used is the temperature of their reference junctions. Remember that thermocouples measure the difference in temperature between the reference junction and the measuring junction. To ensure the accuracy of your readings, it's important that the temperature of the reference junctions remains constant. If the temperature around the reference junctions increases, so will the temperature of the junction. This will cause the difference in temperature between the reference junctions and the measuring junctions to decrease. The result will be inaccurate readings. One common example where this may occur is if the control room air conditioning breaks down. The control room heats up and so do all the reference junctions and the control room recorders. In this situation, you, as an operator, can't depend on the accuracy of the thermocouple readings. Instead, you must realize that the readings you see are less than the actual temperatures being measured. Another place that thermocouples are often used are bearings. This one is measuring bearing metal temperature on a boiler feed water pump. In this case, the measuring junction is embedded in the bearing casing. It's also connected to a recorder in the control room. Notice that there is also a bimetallic thermometer on this pump. It's used to measure the temperature of oil leaving the bearing. It's not uncommon to find different types of temperature measuring instruments on one piece of equipment. In this case, by checking both bearing metal temperature and oil temperature, you can get a very accurate indication of how well the bearing is operating. A second type of electrical temperature measuring instrument is a resistance temperature detector, or RTD. RTDs work on the principle that resistance in a coil of wire increases as temperature increases and decreases as temperature decreases. This simplified diagram of a typical RTD will help you understand how they work. This coil of wire acts as the sensing element and is placed where the measurement is to be taken. The coil is connected to an electrical circuit. This circuit has a constant voltage applied to it from an external power source. As the temperature of the coil changes, the resistance of the wire changes in direct proportion to the change in temperature. This change in resistance is then converted into a temperature measurement that is displayed on an indicator. Here's an actual RTD used to measure gas temperature flowing through an air preheater. A window in the wall of the preheater housing allows us to see the sensing element of the RTD. It's in the end of this long probe. On the outside of the preheater, the sensing element is connected to a junction box, which connects the sensing element to the RTD's electrical circuit. You'll find RTDs used throughout the plant. Since they are more accurate than thermocouples, they are used where knowing the exact temperature is important. The final type of electrical temperature measuring instrument that we'll talk about is the contact pyrometer. Pyrometers are basically portable thermocouples that take surface temperature measurements wherever needed. A probe on the pyrometer is placed directly on the surface of a component and held there long enough to give an accurate temperature indication. As the probe heats up, an indication of temperature is displayed on the pyrometer's scale. The response time may vary from instrument to instrument, so it is necessary to consult the manufacturer's manual or your plant's operating procedure to learn the proper response time for the pyrometers you're using. Now, keep in mind that when you use a contact pyrometer, you're measuring the surface that the pyrometer contacts. This is particularly important when measuring bearing temperature because the temperature of the bearing housing where the pyrometer is placed is cooler than the actual temperature inside the bearing. This must be considered when determining if the temperature is within manufacturer specified limits. The electrical temperature measuring instruments we've discussed can be portable, like the pyrometer, or permanently installed on a component, such as a bearing housing. Well, this brings us to the end of our discussion on electrical temperature measurement instruments. 
In this unit, we've shown you how level measurements can be taken directly using dipsticks and float devices and indirectly using load cells, diaphragm switches, and standard columns. You've also seen how temperature can be measured using thermometers, filled thermal systems, thermocouples, RTDs, and contact pyrometers. Understanding how these instruments work gives you an important edge in determining whether an improper indication is an actual problem in a system or simply an instrument in need of repair. Take time now to finish reading the material in the text and answer the questions at the end of the unit. If you have any questions about level or temperature measurement, clear them up with your instructor before going on. In the next unit, we'll look at instrumentation diagrams.